Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the everyday struggles of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Liz Manischel. And I am Ulrich Purcell. This week, we have director Matt Eskandari on the show to talk about directing his latest film, Hard Kill, starring Bruce Willis, Jesse Metcalf, and Lala Kent. Go shoot your movie. Like, don't wait for permission to be a filmmaker. This is Matt's sixth feature and third starring Bruce Willis. He gives us a lot of insight and intel on what it takes to direct genre films. But before we get to Matt... Listen to me! Television is not the truth! We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. What's the haps, Ulrich? (laughs) So this week on Network, we have an article that really makes me a happy person. This is from Deadline, and it's really funny because it's like an article that has a bunch of shit in it. It's like, oh, Emmy stuff and Steve Martin clearing out his awards or whatever. And I skipped all that down to the bottom, and there's this update about the Oscars and how there's so few movies in the Oscars screening room right now for the Academy. So like, I guess they have, they watch a bunch of movies to decide which movies are, is this even to be in consideration for the Oscars? Is it that, or is it like, I have no idea. Yeah. It, you have no idea. (laughs) I don't know how it it sounds like it's the pre, it's like the pre phase. It's like, we're going to watch a bunch of movies and then we're going to decide which ones are going to be up for consideration. And then they send the screeners out from there. So it's like the first step, I think. And there's like 63 titles available, but then they, the writer said that they reached out to a bunch of Academy members and some are saying there's only 37 options on there. And I guess that's, that's gotta be like way less than normal. It's probably more like a couple hundred, I'd imagine, in a regular year, maybe even more. But the fun thing about this is that previous guests of the show, uh, Brett and Drew Pierce, their movie, The Wretched, is like getting attention. And it was like mentioned in the article, like, oh, The Wretched is like this horror movie that would never be on here, but is here now and people are watching it. I'm like, oh man, that's awesome. So I wonder what this means for those guys and for me for the wretched. I think it's just, it's pretty cool. Maybe it's just cool, but I don't know. Maybe we'll see some more indie movies, uh, you know, being considered for Oscars this year. I, I don't know. We talked about this before and you're a negative. Liz. Yeah. Has your mind changed <laughs> no. about this? I'm no? just laughing because it's like the same narrative of Auric being happy and Liz being sad. No, I'm just like, oh, they'll find a way. They'll find a way to screw us over. They'll like, <laughs> like they'll open up the restrictions for one year and they'll say, oh no, we just mean budgets over 50 million dollars or in consideration so i just have this feeling over 50 million no <laughs> way that's stupid. okay that's ridiculous that's stupid but i do think something's gonna happen you think something bad's yes, gonna happen of where they're gonna like prevent us from having access to prevent somehow. the wretched from being in consideration prevent for it's like someone that we know who's like within our network <laughs> to get something very wonderful in their lives happening yeah i'm very negative about this yeah, I don't know. I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. I think these movies are going to get more attention. I think we're going to see some titles on there that we haven't, that we wouldn't have normally seen. I, I don't know, like, if it, like, it'll be like Invisible Man is going to get a lot more love or whatever, because that came out earlier this year and it's actually a very good movie. I saw it last week and uh, that normally probably wouldn't get any kind of love, but maybe it will now because there's just so fewer options to choose from. It'd be great if more genre films got serious consideration this year. Absolutely. That would be the coolest thing. Like, I mean, obviously the coolest thing would be if like micro budget features got attention. But like the second coolest thing would be if like straight comedies, horror films, sci-fi, action films, if they all actual actually got consideration. Yeah. So your movie Speed of Life came out this year, didn't it? In 2020? Yes. So there's a chance that Speed of Life is in these this in this list of 63 films right no there's like li- no no because i could think of why is it why so why is the wretched have a chance and you don't have a chance i'm just curious like well okay i actually i haven't read the qualifications for this year but my assumptions are that a we didn't do any sort of print advertising campaign so that usually mm-hmm. is a, a qualifier oh, yeah. um mm-hmm. we didn't do any theatrical we did one theatrical engagement and that was in san francisco so we didn't do la and new york and we didn't capture any press attention from major outlets so for me it's like in what world in the crazy bizarre didn't you get like an article in variety or something like that it wasn't something that i that we know of i think it was 
deadline and it was before the film came out there you go deadline that's a real coverage come on now and it was you always sell yourself short well, thank Liz. you but it wasn't i didn't arrange it someone someone from our cast or crew leaked it and that was like the most wonderful horrible thing <laughs> why was it horrible <laughs> because the agents were like why did you use that image we didn't approve that image and i'm like i didn't submit this no one approved anything it just went out and i contacted the writer and i was like we'd love to update you and she never responded and any press is good press come on yeah now. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, i wanted to ask you about this uh berlin film festival is going to do unisex acting uh, awards. Oh, which I think is weird. super interesting. It's like this is the year of all these like yeah. crazy changes. So what does that what does that mean exactly? I think it's like it's best like actor, the, the, like best performance. So there's no there's no best there's no dif- differentiation. Yeah. It's just going to be best actor and, and one award. So they're basically taking an award away. Well, I don't know exactly. I don't know like the accounting of it all. So maybe they you know still have. You know, I'm, I assume it would. I I don't think they added on like ensemble, but it'd be yes, it'd be conflating the two best actor and best actress categories together. So, in that case, yes, it'd be one less award. Is that is it a good thing or you know? Oh, I was like so is excited. Like progr- is it a pro- is it a progressive thing? I to thought do it that? was. I don't know. I th- maybe maybe I'm foolish. It, to me, it just seems like they're taking away uh, honoring two different you know categories the lines of gender are definitely different than they were you know when these categories were designed i think it should just be more inclusive that's what i like about it it's like it acknowledges the spectrum right the the gender spectrum but also i think there was uh thoughts of these like even 10 20 years ago there were people talking about getting rid of division by gender for awards and i think the theory back then was like that women would blow men out of the water with all the awards and then men wouldn't get a chance oh, there's like all these different speculations but then also it's like the quality of role is also up for debate here it's like there are wonderful roles for women but probably not as many as compared to those for men in terms of substantive characters who are like really fleshed out so it's that are being made right. now but it doesn't mean that that could change hopefully later, it changes yeah so it's like it doesn't hopefully seem it is dry. changing yeah i know but it's like oh right. this year is so interesting virtual film festivals yeah it's all cool i see i don't yeah i think it's a really interesting thing like like is that something that we should be moving towards like unisex um you know awards for for acting categories is that a thing that's better or is that like i don't know i'm not sure yeah, me neither I, I, don't, I don't i don't really know what my opinion is on it to be honest like if someone asked me like oh should we get rid of best actor and best actress and just have best best actor for everybody like, I don't know if that's the better solution. I have no idea. I mean, I also think word shows are a crock of shit. So, like, you know, whatever. <laughs> but right. Well, they, mo- they mostly I are. do <laughs> like shaking up the old guard. And I do like things that are yeah. different. So, for me, I'm just like, oh, I'm excited to see how this is embraced. I'm excited to see who wins and how the judges take to it. And then we – and then I guess if things evolve beyond that, other award shows or other – uh, awards evolve beyond that because of it. I was just excited for change. That was nice. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm curious to hear what people think. So if you guys have an opinion on this, you should just email us at podcast at making movies is hard dot com or tweet at us or any of the things because this is something that I really curi- I'm curious. Like what where do people land on this? Like is it the progressive thing to have a unisex acting thing? Or is it like, let's just, you know, be more inclusive in including people of all different... Gender identities, yeah. Gender identities, okay. Yeah, into, you know, whatever category. I don't know. I'm curious. Yeah, no, I want to know also if other people think it's progressive or not. And then also back to your original article that I completely took us away from. <laughs> it's like, is the future... A positive one like last week our player you know player of the week question was like how do you think the pandemic is going to change the film industry and we had like two really optimistic responses i know our, yeah right so it's like maybe people are just feeling excited for these opportunities and maybe again liz is just wearing her sad pants so we'll <laughs> right, find out right. yeah totally so liz yeah uh, you've got mail. My breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You've got mail. We've got mail. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this we... week, it's just another iTunes review because 
you know, we get a lot of emails from people, but they're not really questions. They're more like, please, can I be on your show? Please, can I be on your show? Please, can I be on your show? Wait, can I please be on your show? Like, that's every <laughs> every email or correspondence we get. So and to it's be not fair, really... a lot of times we do say yes. <laughs> like, we do. We do. We yeah. They're like, yeah, come on. I mean, we, 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 and if you have an interesting story, we're not going to shut you out, you know? Um, but yeah, we, but we have been getting a lot of iTunes reviews lately. So it's, it's been fun to read these, but uh, Liz, do you want to do the honors? Again, this is not a stranger, but this is Stephanie Davis. <laughs> who been on the show. <laughs> lovely, lovely human uh, who, who titled their review, Realistic Movie Making Advice. Uh, five stars. Uh, So Stephanie says, I've been listening since the beginning and the show gets better and better. Timothy and Ulrich had their chemistry and flow that worked for the show as their skills evolved toward making their first gesture films. I think that means I think that was a typo for feature, but maybe not. Maybe it's a gesture films is a thing. (laughs) Is it? Okay, but she said gesture film. I mean, now I'm like, this is a whole show (laughs) is like, what is it? Yeah. Is the gesture like your calling card? Okay, Uh, first films congrats Alric. now with liz the show is leveling up with tools for filmmakers belts the guests all bring something new to think about and there's something for everyone highly recommend well stephanie you are a fabulous human so thank you for that lovely review yes thanks stephanie and yeah she's been always very active in twitter and stuff like that and responding to things over the years so i appreciate the love there too stephanie means a lot so, if you want to be like Stephanie Davis, you can send us a question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. Or, if you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes or any of the places you can leave reviews for podcasts. And we also have a Patreon page, so if you really love the show and you want to support us, go over to www.patreon.com slash podcast. Give us a buck, five bucks. We still have more pins, right, Liz? Yeah, we got there. some pins. I mean, just barely. Just the last just, exclusive. Oh, okay. Very few left. We'll get them before they run out, guys. And then, Liz, you want to talk about the other really exciting thing? Yeah. If you want to head over to our Instagram page, you can click the link in our bio. And we have a brand new YouTube page because we hit our minimal target of getting 100 subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're we're like a real YouTube show. So yeah, join us. Join us. Watch the video content. See what we look like. See what our guests look like. Lots of things to look at. And join us and leave comments and subscribe. I really do like seeing our guests. You know, I was watching some of the uh, Eugene uh, Colt Lurienko episode from last week. Yeah, it's just fun to see like him expressing himself and just like, you know, t- t- talking and being engaged uh, with what he's saying. And I don't know, just I think it adds a whole nother level to the show. It also makes people more human, right? It's like, I think people could be very intimidating as a voice. Like I sometimes am like, I don't want to upset them, don't want to say the wrong thing. But then when you see their face, I think we've said this before, it's like, oh, you're just another human who makes movies. I like seeing your face human. Yeah, let's see more of your faces, humans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Liz, do you want to do the yeah. honors? Yeah, we're here to talk about another fabulous short film. So here's Get Shorty. So you make movies, huh? I produce feature motion pictures. I got an idea for a movie. This week, we have indie writer-director Kylie Eaton to talk about her brand new proof of concept superhero short film, Kinetic. And here is Kylie. Hi, I'm Kylie Eaton. I'm the director and screenwriter of Kinetic. I chose to make a short film because I wanted it to act as a proof of concept. I have a feature length script of Kinetic that I wrote and that placed as a finalist in the 2019 Screencraft Sci-Fi and Fantasy competition. And I, you know, I couldn't go out and make the entire feature on my own, but what I did want to do was be able to give people a sense of the world the characters, the conflict within the story, as well as a taste of the superhero nature of the film. And a proof of concept that's five minutes long was really attainable for me to be able to go out and make on my own as an indie short. And so that's, I think the beauty of shorts is they can serve as a proof of concept for a feature. They can also sort of showcase your skills as a director and act as a proof of concept for your overall career. And so in that way, I think they're really versatile. The story of Kinetic was something that was really important for me to tell because when conceiving of and writing the feature script, I really wanted to take a look at the superhero genre from this lens of a daughter dealing with her absentee mother and dealing with this replacement mother figure of her aunt, who's a very imperfect and flawed person, but who's doing her best, just like everyone else. Um, And the central character of Jess, 
like I said, she's a teenage girl. She lives in a home that's filled with crime, generational trauma, absent parents. And, you know, I think that I wanted to take a realistic look at what would happen if a, a, a young girl in that situation all of a sudden had telekinetic powers. You know, what would she do with those powers? How would she develop her own moral compass? And so there's just a preview, a little snippet of that in the proof of concept, but I, I you know, obviously expand on that in the feature, but I, I still wanted that to be at the central core of the proof of concept of the short film, because that is really the main question of the overall story itself is, is how do we sort of form our own moral compass as we're becoming adults and separating from our parents? How do we see the world and how do we see right and wrong? In terms of funding, Kinetic is entirely um, self-funded. I was able to put together, you know, an indie production on the fly. I had a lot of people donate their time, equipment, volunteer, all of that um, to help Kinetic come to life. You know, and I think that's the great thing about, about indie film and building a community is you're able to have each other's backs and help each other out on projects. For this particular project, since I'm based in LA and we were shooting in Indiana, a few of my key crew members came out with me, but most of the crew I sourced from Indiana. And luckily I was introduced to a producer, Dakota Taylor, who helped us crew up and found a lot of film students that he's friends with or recent graduates who came out and, and helped us create this film. I try not to go into any of my projects with expectations because that's just not how the universe works, you know? We never know what's gonna come out of something. So going into Kinetic, the real expectations I had were to create something that felt authentic to the feature script and also felt authentic to my style, um, my tone, and my themes as a director. And I, I was, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I think it's very representative of all of those things. You know, I was super excited to get accepted into Indie Shorts 2020 for our festival premiere. We um, actually shot this film while I was in Indiana last year for Indie Shorts 2019 with another short film of mine. That was just the perfect place to premiere. We were in the Indiana Spotlight program and it was obviously all online and virtual this year. Um, and that was a great experience. And we just premiered on Film Shortage and I'm just really excited with all the feedback. And I think it's a great introduction for people that are interested in reading the script. Once they see this, if they wanna know more, learn more, read more, you know, they can reach out and, and read the feature version as well. So the purpose of, of the proof of concept of Kinetic, now that it's out in the world, I think is, like I talked about before, it's, it's really both to showcase myself as a director and also serve as an introduction to the larger feature script. Now it's out in the world, everyone can see it. I think that, you know, if it catches someone's eye, that's looking to produce a film, looking to finance a film, that's sort of the, the, the big goal with it. But I think really overall, I just want people to enjoy themselves for, for five minutes while they watch it. And, you know, maybe it connects with them on a certain level and, you know, maybe it makes them interested in watching the rest of my work. And that's, you know, kind of always the main goal as a filmmaker is to get your work out into the world. The inspiration for me to have the world die around Jess at the end of the proof of concept of Kinetic uh, was drawn from the feature script. It's a little bit of a preview into the cost of Jess's powers. And I think that, you know, that part of the feature for me, I really wanted to bring into the proof of concept because it is really a central theme. You know, Jess has these extraordinary powers, but nothing in life comes for free. There's always a cost to every decision we make. And that's something that, you know, I wanted to look at this 14 year old coming to terms with these powers, but also learning that there are consequences. That's been something that I always connect to when I see that in a superhero film, you know, when they recognize that, yes, they might save the day, but also they create destruction along the way and sort of having to weigh, is the destruction worth getting what I want? And I think that's, it's fun to look at it through a superhero lens, but it's also something that we all deal with in our normal lives. And especially as we're coming of age and, and, and really learning that our actions have consequences, I think it's a, it's a really strong moment in our lives and, and one that I wanted to explore in this way. You know, the destruction of nature in the feature script is also a little nod to climate change and how our actions 
have consequences not just in our own lives and the lives of people around us but worldwide and and literally to the world so um it kind of has a dual meaning and i you know i think that it's it's a it's a visual way to sort of hint at that theme that really plays out in a larger way in the feature script. Thanks so much for having me on to discuss Kinetic. You can find Kinetic online at Film Shortage and you can find me at KylieEatonFilm.com. Thanks. So Liz, that's one hell of a short film. I mean, especially <laughs> on like what seemingly is no budget. It's like, wow, really did, oh. did a pretty good job. That that's got to have a budget. That film. I mean, she said like it's like basically scrapped it together. So you know, I, do not trust. You, you don't trust. You think it was a hundred thousand dollar budget? Gazillions of dollars. It looked that good. It really. I mean, the visual effects were incredibly impressive. It's really great. Super polished. Yeah. What else do you have to say about this short? I think the performances were really good. And if I'm watching, looking, because I got the stills for the short before I was able to watch the actual, um, you know, thing. And I think, I think I saw a trailer that was like 30 seconds long or something. So it's kind of really hard to tell like, oh, is this actually going to be a good story? Is there actually going to be good performances behind it? Or is it just going to be beautiful looking and just sort of like doing kind of a Clark Kent, you know, in Kansas sort of thing, but, you know, with a woman instead of a guy right and it's much more than that it's got a really great story the uh the performances were super awesome i think the aunt and and the lead character both were great i really liked the the vfx because i feel like in some ways some of them were really simple and like they didn't really do all that much but it really sold it in the moment especially with the thing where she's like closing the safe or opening the safe or whatever it's just like nice little things that are just done well and, and obviously didn't cost anything it was just like sound design and and cinematography um and then the ones that they did spend money on were really really good and then overall i just i love the tone and i love the style it just had a really like like you basically have my money for this movie like if this comes out i would definitely go to the the theater i completely agree i also feel like not just for seeing it in the theater i was pretending i was an investor and i was like I would like to invest in this director. I felt like convinced that she was capable, talented, proficient, like all of these things. And I, I keep thinking about the very beginning of the short, and I think it's just three shots. I mean, I I know that I would have overcovered that moment. And I just love seeing like a film where you're like, oh, this this director is confident enough just to like communicate things without like 15 different close ups, without three million different detail shots, but with just like a plan in mind. It just felt very like choreographed. I really like this is such a minor touch when our lead kind of has her climactic moment and where she finds her powers, her eyes glowed green and I, unless I projected that onto her, but it was like this very nice touch, right? And it really worked for me. But anyway, I like I'm obsessed with the performances. I thought it was really, really good. And it made me want to make a short. Like it made me think like this is the potential of a short coming to fruition. Yeah, it was, it's really well done. And I, I'm really curious, like I wish I could have asked her now after we talked about it, like how many shots did they do for that opening? Did they yeah. do like a million shots? And then in editing, they just like, use three of them only that you know or or was it really that specific like no we only need these three shots we're not doing anything else because i've been on both sides like sometimes i've overcovered and then like only used a little bit and then sometimes i f felt like no like i only need like two shots to tell this part of the story and then i feel like i'm completely fucked because i didn't explain it <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to you kylie for getting it right and just a reminder if you want us to talk about your short film uh do what we what we said to do earlier email us podcast and making movies is hard.com i will say that like everyone who sends in their shorts i'm i'm keeping a like a catalog of them so you know i'm i'm gonna go back to the well every time we need a new one basically so if you haven't heard from us and you send us your short don't worry i will respond um i'm also trying to just respond to people to thank them for sending the short film over too because mm -hmm. i know how like vulnerable that is to share your work. So, so yeah, thanks guys. But Liz. What about truth? What about the reality? What about the way the old ending tested in Canoga Park? So this week, as, as, uh, as hard as I tried, I could not find anyone to weigh in on our prompts. And I know, boo! And it got me thinking, I know, I think this is a really cool opportunity. Like we really want to promote women's voices. We really want to hear from 
themselves. We don't want to like prompt or prime anyone. We just want to hear what people have to say and then we just put it on the show. But I think it's a little bit of a large lift for people. I'm getting comments where they would prefer to be interviewed or they forget or they say they'll do next week's. But um, I have to say we it's yeah it's getting to be a little bit of a hassle to gather these sound bites. So I'm thinking maybe we take a little break just a short break and then reconfigure this segment so that it's easier for people and we get more people involved. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Uh, I liked your idea, Liz, of just doing little mini interviews with people, just like schedule a time with them and just like talk to them for like 10 minutes and then like, you know, have that be the segment versus pre-recording. Cause I think, I don't know, maybe that'll make it easier for people to say yes, but maybe we'll run into the same problem. I don't, I don't know. But I'm curious. Yeah. Also, it's like I find that once you get two people or three people or whoever many people together, it's never going to go 10 minutes. You know what I mean? And it's like they're going to say something really cool. And like you and I are both going to be curious about what that means. And we're going to try to dig. Uh, But you're we have to have discipline. We have to be like really (laughs) strict and be like, no, no. okay. I'm sure there's like lots of great things here, but we have to stop right now. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's. That's put a clock, put a timer, you know. But since we have this time, I did want to a- ask you a question. I was on a, a filmmaking panel yesterday, uh, the Filmmaker Fiesta run by uh, Nicole de, de Menci. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, Nicole, yeah. I'm so sorry that you said your name wrong. But um, but yeah, she had a great group of filmmakers, um, com- kind of from all da- different ba- backgrounds. Debbie Brubaker, who I don't know if you know who Debbie Brubaker is, but she's like a kind of yeah. legendary Bay Area producer who's done like millions of movies and works on everything big. And she's just like this really wonderful amazing person who like she's so sweet she'll give her time to anybody like Mm. 10 years ago she met with me for coffee and she didn't even know who any me at all like I think maybe I had a really loose recommendation to her or maybe I cold called her I can't remember but she went and we had bagels and she answered all my questions and she's really fantastic and so she was on the panel and she had a lot of great things to say but what I'm trying with the question that I want to ask you was that this came up in the conversation was like short films they're like oh yeah we're gonna put it on YouTube and then I think it was actually Nicole was like no don't just put it on YouTube you could do much better than that like you could find like some place where they'll they'll you know it's paid or you can get some sort of deal like your short film's good like let's don't just put it on YouTube but to me that's the point of a short is to put it on YouTube or Vimeo is so people can see it easily it's the point isn't to make money it's so hard to make money with short film and I bet you that at least people who are putting them on platforms they're probably not seeing any money or if they are it's probably like dollars right like like very very little so i don't know i just think that like if you make a short film you put all the trouble into it you gotta put it out there for people to see like like kylie's film like kylie's film doesn't do her any good if people don't see it right that, like that's the whole point is it's this proof of concept to get people excited so yeah i don't know that's where i stand on it but what about you liz like, are you feeling like kylie's film is on a website that's not youtube it's a vimeo link but it's embedded into her Gosh. page Oh, but, is but it? it? But it's but yeah, also, but it's available for free. Like you don't it is need available to pay. For free. Okay, so we always got this question. I worked at Sundance. They were they're always like, "What do I do with a short film?" And we would always say, "Put it behind an email wall because an email is worth more than um, you know than thirty four cents or whatever that you would get from iTunes if you sold it and you know various other streaming platforms." But I think yes, if you don't get any sort of distribution where it would be like from HBO or Netflix and it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars for your short film, then it is about expanding your audience. And most people don't want to put their email addresses in order to watch a short and don't want to pay to watch a short. And it's unfortunate. And I'd love to live in a world where like filmmakers could all take a stand and be like, no, you don't get to watch any of our content unless you pay us what we deserve. But that's not the world we live in. We have to compete against free content. So I'm with you, Elric. I really think you have to do what expands your network the most. And unless you're really getting money like real money from someone who licenses the film you know then yeah not like a non-exclusive you know whatever putting on this platform thing oh look we have matt all right well we're here with matt eskandari from hard kill welcome to the show matt thank you it's a pleasure thanks for having me on yeah, so here's the first uh, rapid fire set of questions. I'll go first. Um, so, how many days did you shoot Hard Kill? Hard Kill was shot in 10 days. 
Uh, what was your budget, or what are you what are you allowed to say what your budget is? Uh, it's hard. I don't really even know the the honest budget. I think it was around seven million, but then you take you know a few million away for Bruce's salary, and that's all you have. Left. <laughs> I knew it. I oh, wow. knew it. That's called it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how long did you work on the film from inception to being released? It was a pretty quick prep period too. We started prepping it in December. And the script had been in development for years, though. It's one of those things that, you know, the production company and the writers had been working on for a long time. And mm. uh, the script was completely different. I stepped in, I gave it a read, and I was like, oh, this is a cool script. We can totally shoot this. Obviously, the, the Donovan Chalmers character was already cast as Bruce. And then it became of, okay, how do you shoot this in uh, very specific restrictions of budget and time and so we had to do a massive rewrite to get it to the place where we needed it to be to be able to shoot mm. the film so that all happened between i think december and end of last december and then right when we went into january i flew out to cincinnati just started hard prepping it we found the warehouse and then you know it was a good five six weeks of prep and then we were shooting wait wow. just to clarify that rewriting process was that a month or a year the part that i was involved in was a month but they had been rewriting for <laughs> wow. a long time it, it was funny we uh we got on the phone with the writers and we were like you guys have a week to rewrite this entire thing to make it shootable otherwise we're not making your movie and they freaked out oh <laughs> We like we put wow. some fire under them. We're like, we can't shoot your movie unless you rewrite it with these, you know, these elements. Bruce has got to be in like this many pages. It was a totally different script. It was more of a AI. It was about this AI who had unleashed this this uh, program on on these guys. It was a totally different script, but it had the elements there. It was about a father and a daughter. You know, it was a smash and grab sort of triple frontier kind of movie. So it was always sort of like the the basics were there. It's just we were trying to figure out how to how to make it shootable in 10 days. How big was the crew? Brew was a decent size. I'd say there was probably like 40, 40 people on set. Yeah, for, especially for the action stuff, there was a lot of choreography and, and whatnot involved. So that was the more complicated aspect. And then out of all your projects, how difficult was this one? Well, this wasn't the most difficult film that I've shot, only because you know I've done like 12 Feet Deep was really challenging. We were shooting in the water for for a long period of time. So that was, I think, had its own challenges. And I think that's still to this day a more challenging shoot because being in the water is just so slow and mm. it's just, it's harder to get things done. So I, th I always think that that's always been my most difficult film, but uh, you know, this one had its own challenges. I think this one, the tricky part was being able to execute all this action within the restrictions that we had, right? I mean, being able to you know, cram everything into as much time that we had and knowing that, you know, I couldn't cut any of it out. I mean, we, you know, the studio expects this many action scenes, this many shootouts, this many gunfights. So we need to all kind of make it all come together. And I definitely don't think I would have been able to do this movie had I not had the experience that I had. I mean, if, if this had been my first movie, it would have been completely screwed. I mean, it was just, it would have been a disaster. But I would just went into it having already directed two more films in the last kind of like year and a half that I was confident. I was like, oh, we can make this work. Like, it's not a big deal. So yeah, there's going to be more complex fighting and action and choreography and stunt work. But other than that, we've done this before and we'll make it work. Can you talk a little bit about how you got attached? I mean, it sounds like you already had one, at least one cast attachment before you were brought on. Was the whole cast gathered before you were brought on or what was the timeline of bringing Kind of, on? yeah. The timeline was, um, so I just directed a, a couple films for Lionsgate slash EFO and they had another film that they were, were already sort of, in, like I said, they'd been in development on it for a year and they already had some casts attached. I think Natalie Eva Marie, the WWE star was already attached to play a role. Mm. I believe Jesse was already attached too. So Jesse, her and Bruce were the main cast. And then the rest sort of just kind of came together like as I was jumping on board. Yeah, so it, uh, it was all sort of, when I came on, a, a lot of the pieces of the puzzle had already been kind of put in place and they just wanted me to kind of come in and put my stamp on it and execute it and just make it work you know what i mean so you didn't get cast approval i mean is that not new? on it depends on the studio or the production company like in the film before this that i do with them 
there was a little bit more time. So I was able to like work with them. Okay. What about this person? What about this person? We went back and forth and, you know, we were able to pick and choose. Like on this film, there was one role, the character of Fox who's played by Texas. Mm -hmm. And I'd worked with Texas on another movie like a year ago. And I was like, Oh, I know the perfect guy to play this. And they knew him too. So I was like, let's just cast Texas. So they cast him right away. So there was a couple of roles where I was able to be like, Hey, let's bring this guy in. Let's bring this guy in. But they have a different model they have like a very specific model. It's based off of, I guess, the pre-sales, the pre-sales of the movie. So they mm. have to get a certain number of names and they add it all up and they work with their sales agent. And like every cast, they have to call the sales agent. Be like, what do you think of this guy? Does this guy help us? No, bring in somebody else. And I'm like, okay, shoot, let me call this person. And uh, Randy oh, and wow. George, Randy and George have a lot of relationships with like talent and cast. So they like pull their strings as much as they can. So can you talk about getting your first movie with, with Lionsgate and EFO or whatever the, the company is and yeah. like how that came about? Yeah. So that was sort of uh, about like a year and a half ago. I'd written a co-written a script with, for, or with, a car, with a screenwriter. It was called The Long Night. It was a home invasion film. And we sold the script to them with me attached to direct. So I knew I was going to be doing that movie. And while we were in sort of development for that, because usually uh, every time you sell a script, you're going to get notes back from whoever you sold it to. And they're going to want to make tweaks or changes. So in the process of doing that, I'd already pitched how I was going to direct the film and this. So they, they sort of kind of familiarize themselves with me and everything. And then I get a call from one of the executives there and he's like, Oh, Hey, we have this other script actually. It's called Trauma Center. It's about this woman. It's like die hard in a hospital. This woman's being chased in a hospital. And I was like, oh, really? Okay, let me, let me take a look at it. You know, send it to me. And like, yeah, and the director, something happened, like he fell through or something. I was like, all right, yeah, send it over. I'll read it. So then I read it and I was like, oh, it's a fun script. It's literally like die hard in a hospital. It's, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they're like, oh, and by the way, Bruce is attached to it, Bruce Willis. And he, we we're thinking about attaching him to your script too and doing the same kind of thing. So this is like a test and I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do it, man. Let's uh, cause they want to see how we get along and, you know, if I'm able to make that film and that sort of just, and it kind of came together and we shot that in Puerto Rico, spent like another five weeks in Puerto Rico prepping. And that one was shot in 12 days. So oh, wow. Two extra days on that. <laughs> luxurious. But, uh, wow. Yeah. Luxury. So we had, but uh, you know, it's uh, it all came together and then that was a good opportunity to actually work with Bruce. I'm so glad I did because once I worked with him on that, that script, I didn't have a lot of input on just because it, it had already been put together. It was like ready to shoot. So I looked at a lot of the scenes that he was in and I noticed the kind of character he, like there was all these scenes where he was like reading exposition or uh, doing a lot of random things. And I was like, why are they wasting Bruce Willis on all these like long winded exposition scenes and, there's like no emotional stakes. There's no drama. It's just him talking or, you know, and I'm like, what is going on? And I noticed Bruce, like he checked out as soon as you do those, like he would do these boring scenes, but then he'd have like this intimate emotional scene with the, the main actress. He'd sit down, he'd run lines with her and everything. And I'm like, Oh, Whoa. Like we need to just only give Bruce scenes he wants to do. Like, why are we wasting his time <laughs> on these terrible, like, you know, this guy's a legend, man, just living, just have him do awesome scenes. So the second film that I did, which ended up surviving the night, every scene I went in there and it was like, all right, if there's no emotional stakes going on here, I'm not going to have Bruce do it. So every scene, there's something going on between like father and son, him and his, him and his wife. There's a lot of depth and, and uh, there's actually a character arc for him in that story. You know what I mean? Like we were able to actually like actually have his character go through an arc. And I knew right away when he showed up on set for that one, I could just tell he was like on. And that was, mm. that was a cool experience. Yeah, like he liked the script better, you know, oh, yeah. more 100%. into the project. That's cool. 100%. Um, was that movie your, the, the script you sold or was that a different movie? No, that was the end? script that we had sold. That was Okay, the one. that's the script. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So that was the second one we did. And then, like I said, once we finished that one, we were in post and then this one came to, came as well. So it was like three projects within the course of almost a year and a half, almost two years. Wow. So it was, it was a lot, but it was fun. I want to go back even further. <laughs> like, yeah. I watched on the lot. And my, actually, I worked for someone who was on the show. I don't know if he was prevalent, uh, like a prominent character, but his name is Michael Simon. He's a multicam TV director. And he was like one of the judges. Um, so familiar. Yeah, that thing. But, I mean, 
so for people unfamiliar, which is crazy if they are because it was like formative for me, but it was a reality show for filmmakers and there's not been a lot of those other than Project Greenlight, which I guess <laughs> could be considered similar. But having gone to USC and it's like now having this really prolific career, can you talk a little bit about going from being on the lot to, I don't even know what to say, falling into or being a part of the Hollywood machinery while also kind of maintaining and protecting yourself as an artist? Like, I'm just curious about like the whole, this is such a long question already. Um, <laughs> awesome. I'm just curious <laughs> about like, yeah, your process and your evolution as an artist. Yeah, no, it's been definitely, it's, there's, no, there's no overnight success in any career. So it's been a long journey. I mean, like on the lot was more than 10 years ago, I believe, right? It was like 2000. It was a while back, yeah. It was a while ago, yeah. So that was a, a cool little adventure, you know, that was like right after film school. I got to be on this reality show. I didn't make it very far. I was only in the first couple episodes and then it got kicked off. But it was a fun adventure. It was good to like meet the other filmmakers and kind of see them. And actually one of the filmmakers on that show just recently messaged me on uh, Facebook and was like, hey man, how's it going? He's And he's doing well too. He's like, he lives in England and he does like films and stuff. So I was like, Hey man, how you been? So it's been cool to see the other filmmakers that you were kind of with in that period and seeing them grow and, and develop themselves as artists. That was right after film school. But then I did my first feature, which was a, a project called Victim. It's like this psychological thriller. It got released by IFC that opened a few doors. And then I got a project off the ground, which ended up being like a, a nightmare, which was this film called The Gauntlet that we shot in China. And uh, oh, wow. it had, uh, I still have flashbacks to that movie, but the, the two great things about it was I got to work with Bai Ling and Dustin Nguyen, amazing oh, wow. actors. Those two are just phenomenal. I got just recently been messaging with Dustin, just catching up and stuff, but I love that guy. But um, so we caught up and everything, but so we shot that movie in China, typical of like, you know, young filmmakers. We went into that very kind of wide-eyed and naive. We kind of chewed off more than we could handle and the film like went over budget and we couldn't finish it and we were stuck in post. And I think we were in post for like th three years. So oh, I didn't wow. direct anything for those that three year period because I was trying to get this film done. And there was a lot of like crap going on with that. And I had this idea like, oh, once the movie's done, I'll just get like a ton of offers for other films, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, this is like the biggest film I've done, you know, it's gonna be so good. And then as I started editing the film, like, oh man, this film makes no sense. It's like, shit, like, how am I going to, so then it all came together. We did reshoots. One that finally came out, actually, I got into Screamfest. It, it premiered at Screamfest. It got picked up by, ironically, Lionsgate. They retitled it to Game of Assassins, and then it came out, and then it didn't really open many doors at all. It was just sort of just like sitting on the shelf. So I was like, oh man, and I had wasted so much time just hoping that this film would do something that in the meantime, I didn't have any scripts. I wasn't doing anything. So there was just like a long period of inactivity where I was just like really frustrated. And I almost thought about quitting. Honestly, I was just like, you know, yeah. maybe this is a sign. Like the directing thing is not for me. It's just like too much. And I actually thought about like, you know, doing something else. But then I was like, no, nah, man, we're going to, we're going to figure something out. So I had a couple scripts that I was trying to, you know, sell bigger budget movies, like action movies and thrillers and stuff. And, I couldn't get any of those scripts sold. You know what I mean? I, I didn't really have good reps. So it was like, it was tough. And then finally I was like, you know what? I'm just going to write a script that I know that I can shoot it literally in my backyard with two awesome. Cause I know a lot of actors. I'll just cast two actor friends, do it in my backyard. And uh, I started thinking, okay, what about like a movie about two girls trapped in a pool? That's so easy. It's like literally like two people in a pool. I'll just go in the pool with two people and, shoot it for you know however long get it done so i got the script done and then and meanwhile i, I sent the script to uh, my manager and he sent it out to a couple production companies and ironically like literally i was prepping the movie to shoot it like with some random actor friends and i get a call from my manager like oh this company called mar vista wants to you know give you half a million to do it and uh you know a lot of, lot of creative freedom and everything and i was like all right i guess that's better than doing it for 200 bucks in my backyard. I guess that, that works. <laughs> wow, man. Yeah. So then I was like, all right, that's, that makes sense. So then I went back into it and I think we had 15 days on that one. So it was still tight. Oh, wow. too. That was a tight Lug too. luxurious. I know. I don't think 12 I and 10. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So that opened up a lot of doors. Once that film came out, I think that's still to my best film. I, I like that film a lot. It's my favorite. 
but um, so that film opened up a lot of doors, you know, got me a lot of meetings. Once it did come out, I think the trailer did like 50 million views. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Man. So it blew up. Yeah. And it was great. And then um, that sort of led to these action thriller Bruce films that I've been the last three that I've done was definitely kind of came from that. Can you talk about that moment, that, that period where you, you know, were in the zone where you felt like you wanted to quit and that you were like, ready to give up and like what were you doing in that period like were you like going on meetings and getting rejected or were you like writing like just talk about that for a bit yeah no it was definitely it was weird because you know i had i had a kind of strange career it's like right out of film school i had an agent i went to screen fest i won an award like that that award up there so like and i before i even directed a, a real feature I was going to all these meetings for like big budget movies for open directing assignments. All like, Oh man, I was only like 24 at the time. So I was like, Oh man, this is insane. Like I'm going to like these meetings for these like big budget movies. And I didn't get any of them, but I was like, wow, this is going to be like a fun, long adventure. And then to go from that to, you know, five, six years later, stuck in post on a, on a film and then realizing that, you know, it's not going anywhere was sort of like soul crushing because it's just like, oh, how did I go from that to now I'm, you know, stuck on post on a film that I can't get done. And at that point, I didn't have any reps. So I wasn't going on any meetings at all. So it was just like me hustling, emailing people, you know, querying, you know, managers and agents and not getting a lot of responses. So it was so, definitely- So after two features, you had no reps? No, no, I didn't have any reps. Interesting. That. Yeah, because wow. I went- to this, like, it, it took a while to get those movies going. And at the time, I was like, when I dropped the rep, my rep, I was like, oh, I can find some better reps. It's cool. Like, I don't need these guys. Like, I can get somebody better. So I sort of went into it very arrogant. And I was like, no, I'll just find somebody else. But it's not easy to just like, find reps. You know what I mean, you got to find yeah. people that like you fit in, like, fit into your style and know what you do. So it was, it was definitely a low period for sure. Like, I was like struggling financially, you know, and obviously after almost, you know, seven, eight years out of film school, like my parents were like, oh, so what are you doing now, man? Like, have you haven't made a movie in like a year. Like, I thought you were like graduating, like filmmaking. And I'm like, yeah, I'm working on it. And they're like, well, what the hell are you going to do? You know what I mean? Like, have you thought about going back to grad school, getting a degree in like medicine or something? And I'm like, no. So, because I come from a uh, an Iranian American background and it's very like stringent education. You know, you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or, you know, or, or, or an engineer, basically, like there's no other career option. So when I, was, when I decided to go into this filmmaking path, there was always that sort of question mark from, from everybody saying like, oh, is this a real career? Can you actually do this? Can you actually make money from this? So it was definitely that all kind of came together at that point and I had to like reassess everything. And I think a lot of it just came down to, I was able to kind of recapture the passion for the craft that was really what it came down to. I just kind of was like, okay, why did I get into this? You know what I mean? Like, I love working with actors. I love telling stories. Let me just tell a simple story. And then that's why how, that's how really 12 Feet Deep came to be. It was because I was like, there's no action in this really. It's just two people. It's a relationship between two sisters. And so it was like forcing myself to really kind of get to the nitty gritty of why I became a filmmaker. And that really was actually a, a, a good uh, it was a good transition period because it forced me to really question everything and come to some stronger uh, perspectives. Is Was genre always the plan or is it um, a means to an end or what is, you know, because I'm seeing hmm. clearly a lot of genre elements in your work. Yeah, no, I'm definitely, I consider myself a genre director. Like I love action, thriller, sci-fi. Those are my, that's my, that's my sort of, uh, favorite favorite kind of films like to me it's like a film has to entertain you and so I always go into it thinking like okay what what is this film like how is this going to be on a visceral level like is this going to scare an audience is this going to keep on the edge of their seat are we going to wow them so genre has always been definitely an important aspect I mean I used to do a lot more horror but now it's more kind of made its way into the kind of action thriller and, and all my favorite directors they're all mostly genre directors like James Cameron and, and those guys so it was always definitely an aspect of it I mean I actually want to jump ahead back to hard kill if that's yeah. right because what I guess what I'm kind of wrapping my mind around is 
you're a storyteller, you've, you've been through the business for many years and taking ownership over a project, but then being brought on when so many things are decided already mm-hmm. for hard kill. And then just like, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you like bite your tongue? How do you like, mm-hmm. you know, convince yourself that like, this is a job or I, I don't even know what's going through your mind. So I don't No, 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 totally. No, it's, um, that's an interesting thought, but yeah, no, there is that aspect of, I just love being on set. You know what I mean? Like, I just love shooting. You know what I mean? Like some directors or some filmmakers, they're just like, Oh, I only like doing like, you know, this specific projects, like spend a lot of time working on it, developing it, you know, kind of that to me is like, man, just get me on set. Give me the script. Let's get to the movie. Like to me, it's like, you can spend years on a script, years developing it, concept sketches, storyboards, animatics. Like I've been through all that before because I know, and if you don't actually shoot the movie, it's like the most frustrating thing in the world because it's just like the project never actually got realized. So to me, I actually prefer if a project is closer to being greenlit or is ready to shoot versus developing something from scratch and kind of ushering it through and going through all those parts. So like when a film like Hard Kill came to me, what was, yeah, it wasn't a script that I'd written, but I had to look at it and be like, okay, what is it about this script that I kind of can kind of pull in from and for me, it was like, oh, this is like a cool, this kind of reminds me of this, like the early 90s smash and grab action flicks that I used to watch as a kid. It's got a simple story. You know, it's not a lot of uh, complexity to it, but it's fun, you know, and I get to play with some cool toys, blow some things up, and you know, and work with some good actors. So that to me was sort of like the appeal to it. And there's that aspect of like, okay, like not every film is going to be like the one where you're like, oh man, I'm so like the one right before this, obviously I was way more um, like invested in the film. And it was like this really, like to, that's still my favorite of the three last films, the Bruce films, To Arrive the Night is, is my personal favorite. Obviously I was more invested in it. I did develop a little bit, a lot more. I just thought it was like, you know, the script was like, had a lot of complex themes, you know, but then for this one, it's like, yeah, there is an aspect of like, this is a job and I got hired to direct this film and execute it and I'm gonna do the best I can to keep, you know, my bosses happy and people that hired me, which is executives. And and along the way I get to work with like Jesse Metcalf and, you know, he's a cool guy and, you know, maybe we'll get to do another film with him in the future. So you have to take in every project as it's an opportunity to tell a story. And when I went through that period of time where it was like I wasn't making films, it was so frustrating. Like I told myself, like dude, if you just get back on set again, just be grateful, man. You're back on set again. You're shooting. You're directing. Don't bitch and complain. Like you're on set. So like there were days where I'm like, yeah, it's tough. We're shooting with ten days or twelve days, but I'm like, dude, I can't complain. I'm sitting on set here with Bruce and Jesse or whoever. Like, this is awesome. Man. This is a dream, dude. I like, I'm loving it. You know what I mean? So it was just uh, being grateful because you know, knowing that any film could be your last film. It could be the last time you're on set again because something could happen. Or, you know, I mean, I went through that period. So it was like this, it was important to me to, to be grateful for that. So I wanted to go back to just a little earlier about like your first movie with Bruce. And like when you're talking about how you had that like kind of test from the studio where they're like, if you direct this movie, maybe we'll make your, your this other movie that we, we sold, you sold us or whatever, you know, that, yeah. that situation. Like, how did you approach that project? And like, especially specifically working with Bruce, like, you know, walking in, that must be pretty intimidating. First time working with, a, a guy like that like you know yeah what was no, your process to get ready for it well it was definitely um you know i'd heard some stuff about bruce like oh man he's tough to work with some directors you know i've heard like kevin smith or these different filmmakers saying things like you know he's tough or he's challenging or, i don't know how you know so i was like i was a little like oh shoot you know and then i would look and then i look at bruce's filmography and it's intimidating because you look at the filmmakers he's worked with and you're like Okay, he's worked with like every A-list director, Tarantino and all these other incredible directors of the last 20, 30 years. So you're like, how is he, like, how am I going to walk up to him and give him adjustments? But like, what the hell, man? He's worked with like Tarantino. Like, what the hell? <laughs> so, so I had to like not think about it and just sign it. And then, but I did go back and watch, um, first thing I did was I went back and watched a lot of behind the scenes stuff the group from Bruce's movies and especially M night. So I noticed like he'd work with M night like a bunch of times and I'm like, okay, what kind of relationship do they have? If you know, he's obviously M night doesn't think he's an a-hole cause they keep working together. So like what's going on here. So I looked at like some of the behind the scenes stuff and then the interviews on like unbreakable and 
And it was interesting how Bruce, he was talking about how M. Night has a really strong vision and, you know, how he's very deliberate about every choice and, and the costume that Bruce was wearing and the color palette, and this. And, and Bruce was like really getting into the creative aspects. And I'm like, oh, wow. So Bruce is this type of actor who wants a filmmaker to like really have a strong vision and walk him through it all and be very deliberate about all their choices and not and not be like wishy-washy or whatever so i was like okay i gotta go in with a really strong idea of how i want bruce to be in this film and not go to him and be like all right what do you want to do bruce you know what i mean like <laughs> so i did that he would be like okay this kid doesn't know what the hell he's doing so you know from right from the beginning i spent a lot of time like i worked with the costume designer to sketch out designs of his costume and you know like deliberate color palette and, and then wrote like a biography for him even though he i don't know if he necessarily read it but like you know, I had it all like prepared for him. I talked to him and I met him actually the day before for fitting. So then I sat down with him and started talking to him about like the story and the character and he was like really receptive. And I'm like, okay, okay, cool, cool. Like he's down, you know what I mean? So it was, you know, it was, it was kind of like feeling that out and then realizing like no matter who they are, every actor, they all just want to have that trust, that relationship with the director and the filmmaker. It's just about trust. He just wants to trust that you're not going to make him look bad and you know what you're doing. So as long as soon as I built that trust with him, you know, it was, it kind of just became like any other actor director relationship, you know, on set, I'd walk over to him and, you know, I'm not the type of director that's like screaming out directions, you know, I'm not like on a megaphone <laughs> anymore, just like I'll, I'll walk over and like whisper, or just have like intimate conversations with different, different actors. So like, I just kept that with Bruce, you know, I'd walk over and just kind of talk him through stuff and, you know, okay, this is what's happening, or can you try it this way, or what if this happened? And he was really receptive. I mean, as long as it wasn't, I noticed, like, you know, as long as I wasn't like, oh, just let's do another take, you know, just for fun, you know, like sometimes Bruce, but why? Like, why am I doing another <laughs> take? And I'm like, just just for fun, Bruce. And he'd like, he'd look at me, and I'm like, oh, shit, he doesn't want to do another take. I'm like, all right, this one, so I'd have to come up with a reason why every take, like, I was like, oh, wow, man, Bruce, so like, you got to know why you want to do every take. Otherwise, he's like, well, why didn't you get, oh, you didn't get it? He'd be like, oh, you didn't get it? I'm like, I did, but let's just do another one just for shits and giggles. But he's like, no, like, you got to tell me what you want. <laughs> so it's interesting to see how, um, from his experience, like, he, that's just how he is. But, um, you know, it was, it was a fun relationship, you know, getting to see him. And, and working with him, I could see now why certain actors are movie stars. He just has, like, this presence on set, behind the camera, his eyes. There's just, like, there's just depth there. You know what I mean? Like he could be shooting a scene with five other actors and the camera just like drifts in his face and he just has <laughs> something going on there. And you're just like, what is Bruce doing? Like, it's just so easy for him. And, and even when he's not even trying that hard, you know what I mean? I'm just like, what the hell, man? Like another thing that he does that I thought was interesting. And I could totally see this in other kind of A-list actors is he makes a lot of like unpredictable acting choices so you look at a page and, you know, you'd see a scene and there's a lot of boring or safe or cliche ways to play that. And a lot of times, like, the actor will just read the line or do the do the scene exactly as it is. But, like, Bruce will just, like, do random things sometimes. Like, he'll walk into the room, pick up an object, and, like, just sometimes it's, like, bizarre. And I'm like, what the hell was that, Bruce? And then other times he'll do things. And, like, uh, the best example I can think of is um, not, on the, not on Hard Kill, but on survive the night there was this scene where there's no dialogue but bruce he his wife has just died and he's stumbling in the in the woods kind of running away and he falls against a tree and then he looks over and he says you know he sees like the bad guys in the house and then he kind of like gathers his resolve and then takes off right it was a pretty simple scene right i mean you know just you know gather your resolve kind of get your strength back and leave and that's how it was on the page and i just told bruce okay, i need you to do this and then right as I, you know, flipped act, you know, called action, he stumbles over, he bumps into the tree. He like starts whispering his wife's name. Like, he's just like, Rachel, Rachel. And then he gets up and he does this massive like predator scream. He's like, ah, like, and I was like, <laughs> what the hell was that first? But there was like, there was all this like pain and anguish in his face. And I was like, that was interesting. Like, and then he falls back to his knees and then just like stays there. And I was like, the hell is that? And then in the moment I was like, I don't know what the hell that was. That would never work. I was like, all right, Bruce, let's do another one where, you know, I got like a regular one. But then as soon as the editor saw it, he was like, dude, that was powerful, man. Like what the hell is Bruce doing? And I was like, really? 
He's like, yeah, man, look at the footage <laughs> again. And I looked at it in post and I was like, holy shit, that was genius, man. That was just like Bruce just doing something wild and different. But he just took that little scene, that little kind of one, two lines and just did something interesting with it. So I noticed he does that mm. a lot. Uh, talking with the costume designer and the, doing the character bio and all that. Is that something that you normally do? You do just for him? No, I mean, I, I get pretty involved in all that with all the all the different characters. Although over the years, I've noticed that I like giving actors more freedom mm. to kind of come up with it. Because I notice if you give the actors more ownership of the character, they feel more invested and in the choices are coming from their own instincts. So a lot of times, like I'll get into that conversation with them and kind of and work with the costume designer rather than just being like, hey, this is your costume. This is what you're wearing. This is like, because then it's it just doesn't feel as organic. So I want uh, I want the actors to come to me like, because I want I want them to know more about these characters than I do. Like I want them mm. to live and breathe these characters more than I do and know them to tell me like, no, Matt, like I don't think he would wear this or I think he would wear. It. And I'm like, that's interesting. Yeah, I can totally say. It. I, mean, I remember even Jesse like we were having conversations and I'm like, yeah, I want you to wear this and this. And we'd have his back and he's like, no, I think he's more blue collar. He'd wear this. I'm like, okay, I can see that. Okay, so I let them sort of kind of run with it because then it gives them more attachment to the character. But with Bruce, it was just like a style change, right? Well, with Bruce, yeah, because there isn't a lot of like prep time with him. So it, mm. it's a little different in that sense. It's like, okay, this is, you know, I have to work with the costume designer before he shows up. And when he shows up, there'll be options for sure. Like a lot of times we'll have like this huge display of stuff. And I'm like, Bruce, what do you think of this? Or it? And he'll try something. I was like, no, I don't feel this. And then We'll give him something else. And there's certain colors he likes to wear. It's kind of interesting. Going back to something that you said earlier, you, you talked about how with Bruce, like you couldn't just say like, let's do another one for fun, you know, whatever. Or like, oh, let's just do it again. Like he needed a reason. Yeah. But in your process of directing, do you ever just do that? Like, because you, like, let's say you didn't get it or you didn't get what you wanted, but you know that giving a direction is not necessarily going to be helpful. That like you just need to see it one more time just to see what the actors do differently. Do you ever do that? Or do you oh, always yeah. give directions? Sometimes. Sometimes I'll, I'll, even if I don't have it, I'll tell the actors like, oh, we got it. Right. We're good guys. We're good. Okay. Now let's do another one just to have another one. Just do whatever now. So it takes the pressure off. Cause like once they think that it's in the can, then they start doing like more interesting things. Sometimes I've noticed that where like once they think that like the pressure is off, they'll start doing weird stuff. So no, totally. I definitely will, you know, and it, and it depends. I mean, obviously on a 10 day shoot, there isn't a lot of kind of leeway to just keep shooting and shooting more takes. I mean, if we had right. more time, then you can kind of get away with more finessing. And, and that's the thing is a lot, a lot of, you know, like a lot of people give like David Fincher shit for doing so many takes, but it really does become more layered. The more takes that you do a lot of times, you know what I mean? I mean, little thing, it just all starts feeling more natural and things just start stripping away and, you know, and, and a lot of times the actors will just start doing things that are more organic as, mm -hmm. as the scene goes on and on. So, no, I mean, I'm definitely a type that likes to get more takes if possible. But a lot, like on Hard Kill, it just, you know, there isn't that uh, that window of opportunity. You know, I mean, you just got to move quickly and hope to have a couple options. So you're doing drive-ins for Hard Kill. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about the release plan and also your involvement in the release plan being a director for hire well for for the release on this one yeah they're doing vod and 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 also some limited drive-ins and, and they actually had a premiere at a drive-in which was incredible like, i saw the video matt you weren't wearing a mask and it stressed <laughs> me out <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah <laughs> but uh it was an incredible experience though to be like in it i've never actually had a drive-in premiere before i don't think i've actually been to a drive-in to be honest, my entire filmmaking, like, I'm never, like, why would I ever go to a drive-in? I just never had a chance. So to be in there and, and see the audience, like, actually watch a movie in the drive-in was uh, was a cool experience. Because, like, you could totally see these type of films more just sort of, like, turn your brain off. Action or thriller or horror is a perfect kind of movie for a drive-in because you're just, you're out in the feet, you're out there and you're just, like, you know, you're, you're in your car and, it's a very sort of visceral experience. It's so different from being in a movie theater. And, um, you know, at the end, like the cars are honking their horns and getting into it. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is awesome, man. So it was, it was a cool experience. So yeah, so the, um, 
so my involvement is basically just helping promote the film. So they, you know, they reached out to me, obviously, to do interviews with filmmaking channels and podcasts and everything. And yeah, that's that's the extent of it. And obviously, kind of just doing my best to, to help market, promote the film, and get it out there as much as possible, and you know, see see how it lands. It's, after doing these three action movies with Bruce Willis, like, do you have a, any idea like what your next thing is going to be? Are you, do you see yourself just doing more movies like this with this studio or other studios or do you have like, another direction? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Well, I definitely am. I, I, I feel like I've completed the Eskandari Bruce trilogy for sure. <laughs> like it was a fun kind of period. So I'm, I'm definitely done with that. You know, obviously this whole Corona thing is, thrown the entire industry and everybody into like a spin so there's definitely a lot of you know things are changing and, and you know and we're trying to get back to set and you know so it's it's definitely been sort of like a transitionary period i had a one project that i was going to do originally over the summer then it got pushed so now i'm just sort of like i don't know if that's gonna even go back up again so it's definitely like i don't have anything set in stone right now and partly it's kind of scary, you know what I mean? It's like you don't have anything like ready to shoot, ready to go soon. So it reminds me somewhat of before I did uh, 12 Feet Deep in a way, because you're just like, oh shit, like what's your next movie? Like every time you make a movie, there's that fear of like, oh man, am I going to get another movie? Like what's my next movie? You always want to have it like lined up and ready to go. So there is that sort of like, uh, what is it? That sort of like fear in, in, in terms of like, what are we, what's going to happen next? But I feel like, you know, now that people are kind of, the restrictions and everything and understanding how to make a movie with these restrictions and COVID, hopefully things will become more solidified, codified and rules and people will understand what they can shoot, what they can't. And I'm hoping that by the time I get to set again, you know, there'll be like very strict protocols and, you know, we won't just be winging it. We'll know exactly like what we need to do. So, yeah, I mean, We'll see what happens, really. We have we have a running question. I, not really. I mean, we've asked a few people, but um, how they think filmmaking will be impacted in terms of the content. So mm. you were saying how, you know, you were back in the world of writing um, a script for, you know, to shoot in your backyard. Like, yeah. Would you consider going into something smaller with more ownership at this point because of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I'd definitely be open to it. Um, I know a lot of producers are like, do you have any pandemic-friendly scripts? And I'm like, what does that mean, man? Like, 12 feet deep again? You want to go back to a swimming pool? Like, what is that? It's like the best phrase, it's... pandemic-friendly. Like, I right, love exactly. That. Yeah, so I'm just like, I don't know. I'll think about it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm open to the idea. I don't foresee. It's not like I was shooting movies with 200 extras anyways. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm not too worried about, you know, being forced to like change my style to to kind of like adjust to this pandemic so much i mean yeah there's going to be obviously uh, things that are changing but i feel like it's more i feel like eventually it's it's more just the the industry itself that's changing in terms of how content's being consumed and the theatrical experience and you know releasing and distribution a lot of that is changing more than anything just like rapid fire fast and that's going to affect a lot of things but once we figure out how we can shoot on set, I mean, I feel like we'll know, like, okay, as long as, yeah, as long as you're not shooting a scene with 400 extras, then, you know, hopefully we can find solutions, creative solutions, CGI, and, and these things to be able to not limit ourselves creatively just because we are in a pandemic. You know, I'd love to be able to not say like, oh, we can't tell the story, you know, because we can't make it happen. It's like, there's always a solution. You know, There's always a way to do it. Yeah, we've heard some really cool stories about filmmakers uh, making movies right now, you know, in this time frame. It's like, yeah, there's all kinds of protocols. Like there's all kinds of rules that SAG makes you jump through, but, you know, people are doing it, you know? So I feel like if other people are making movies, like, you know, I think we all have a shot at it, you know, just has to be the right circumstances. And I think also, like the budget needs to be there for the COVID protection because right. yeah. like, you know, I've been hearing $30,000 roughly um, in addition to your budget, you know, to, for like a, a small, like 20, 25 person crew or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think like I was talking to another producer yesterday and she was just saying it's completely all over the map, like depending on the budget and the scope, but like she couldn't give me a hard number for like how much more COVID was adding to her budgets. Cause it was so project dependent. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah. I just I think it's a really interesting time and I'm, I'm really excited to, you know, to get the chance to go back out there and make a movie. But I, I don't know, probably not till 2021, I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely I mean, yeah, I mean, I 
I don't know if I'll shoot another movie this year. I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I was supposed to, but everything got pushed. So now it just becomes, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, check in with your producers. Be like, hey, here's some new COVID guidelines. Hey, here's a new way that people are doing it. Here, this is a filmmaker who made this movie in Coachella right. or whatever. Like, you know, just like do the research and push them because then maybe maybe they'll decide to do it. You never know. I know exactly, and that's true. I know uh, this company, the company that just did this film, what they tried to shoot another movie in Puerto Rico like a month ago. They got shut down because a couple oh, people shit. got a couple people got COVID, and then they had to. Wow. And they spent weeks prepping. They went back there. They started prepping again. And they had to shut down. So I was like, ah, it's like that. That dude. sucks, dude. Yeah. So wow. We'll see what happens. Let's wrap things up with some of these longer view questions. Yeah. Um, so Matt, uh, what's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now? Is it the first film that I made? Uh, the Taking, the short film, actually. It was that short horror thesis film I made at USC. And I'm really proud of that film. I mean, we shot that, uh, you know, I was still in film school. It won a lot of awards and it still holds up pretty well, pretty good. Like I was watching it like, like a year ago again. And I was like, Oh wow, this is like a cool little suspenseful horror film. So yeah, I'm still proud of it. What's the best filmmaking advice you ever received? That's a tricky one. So many. Um, I feel like the best filmmaking advice is probably just go shoot your movie. Like don't wait for permission to be a filmmaker. You know what I mean? Like nobody needs to give you permission or give you an opportunity to create, just shoot something, just do it. Like just the process itself will make you uh, a better filmmaker. Do you have a goal? Like uh, whether it's awards or number of films, what, what are you shooting for? I don't know, if, like for me, it's just, I wanna be a, a director who has like a body of work and who's had a successful career. So whatever that defined, like however that's defined, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, yeah, I'd love to do a movie for like Marvel or like, I mean, I have dreams too, you know what I mean? I'd love to do like a james bond movie or a mission impossible movie or something cool like that but you know it all just you never know i mean it's just like just being able to like shoot movies and tell stories and, and have a successful career as a director is i think the goal that i'm shooting for if you could go back in time what's one piece of advice you would give yourself don't give up just keep going just keep focused and stay focused and just be really persistent and finally uh, is making movies hard? Yes, and that's a good thing because nothing that is worthwhile is is uh, is easy. You know what I mean? Like if it was easy, it's, it's boring. Like it's making films is a hard thing, and that's a, and that's good because you know it really pushes you, changes you, and then makes you a better artist. So it's a good thing. Beautiful. So Matt, where can people find you if you want? If they want to watch uh, Hard Kill or any of your other movies, do you have a website? Uh, is there a certain place they should go to find you? Yeah, no, uh, all my films are pretty much all on the iTunes, so they can check them out. Twelve Tips there, Survive, Hard Kill, uh, and obviously I have an Instagram. If somebody wants to follow me on Instagram, I post a lot of like behind the scenes things and you know clips and whatnot. And so yeah, if you guys want to follow me on Instagram, that'd be great. Awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, it was yeah, a pleasure. Great, so much, man. great conversation, guys. It was a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. It's great to, yeah, great to chat. Thanks so much for listening. And thanks to Matt Escadari for being on the show and Judy Merrick from KWPR for setting up this interview. You can check out our website at makingmoviesishard.com where you can find links to the things we talked about on this episode. If you want to get in contact with us, you can send an email to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com or find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at MMIH Podcast. Also, YouTube. We're on YouTube. And we're also, um, I'm on Twitter, Ulrich B, and Instagram. Liz, where are you? I'm Liz Manischel Film on Instagram and Liz Manischel on Twitter. And if you dig the show, uh, help us get the word out. Tell a friend, email somebody, say, hey, look, I saw this cool podcast. You could tweet about it too, but you could also leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, which would really help us spread the joy of filmmaking and independent filmmaking to the masses. Thanks to our producers, Greg Holdsman and Joshua Sterling Bragg, editor Colby Crow, and the whole Blood Studio Media team for making this episode possible. And we will see you guys next time. Oh yeah, we could say see you because yeah, camera. And I can point like this too, you know, and people can see it. I'd be like, yeah, see you guys. Our hundred subscribers time. can see you. Yeah. Yes.